It's Friday. It's pre-recorded. Now the show doesn't love the Nine Years Podcast. Hello. Yeah. Nine Years Podcast is back, everyone. The worldwide leader in AFC Wimbledon audio entertainment back for a fifth season, somewhat remarkably escaping the off-pod census, but times, they are uh, changing. Thursdays are no more. We had to pick a new day to release the show, and well, we decided that that day is... Podcasting, 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 fun, fun, fun. Looking forward to football on the weekend, certainly. Nick Draper back here with Stuart Deacons. And Stu, I think we have to begin by explaining exactly why we are now on Fridays. This has to do with giving us a little bit more time to record the show as and when there is a Tuesday night game. Normally this wouldn't be a problem. We just record on the Wednesday night, but Wednesday nights now, you're starring in Crawley's one-month or monthly play, aren't you? Their production of the... Oh, no, it's the Epsom Playhouse, that's right, of Priscilla Queen in the Desert. So Wednesdays are out now as well, so we have to have the Thursday to give us a chance to record this thing. Well, yeah, that is, that's a nice story, but it's not true. Of course, I, I'm, I'm probably more... I like to do a Ray Wilkins tribute act than I am to do that. Of course. Um... But yeah, no. What's the reason for Fridays? Well, basically because we have a we we got used to having a day of mourning after every midweek game, didn't we? So we're just shocking most of the season. So it just gives a little bit more chance just to get our thoughts together and be professional on the podcast. <laughs> this is the fifth season. I'm not sure professional has ever been used to describe us in any way, shape, or form. Anyway, this week, first show of the season, we're having a bit of a catch-up show, aren't we? We're going to go through all of the events since we were last with you on this said podcast. We're going to be looking at our pre-season and you're going to try and help me, aren't you, by trying to explain to me what's going on in pre-season because I don't pay attention to it whatsoever. So it's a learning experience for myself this week as well. We have a new game. Everybody loves the game. So, of course, we've got a new one for the new season and then we'll have bits and pieces from League One and the ladies team and little bits and pieces in the middle. We've got some friendlies to sort of half preview, but that's your job, Stu, because, as you know, I don't do pre-season. Well, nor have I, because we haven't stayed in the UK for much of it, really. So, um, we have yeah, I, I, I'll do my best. I'll do my best to keep it, um, well, I was going to say, again, professional. I use that word again. But, yeah, I'll try and give you a little bit of an idea of what's going on in pre-season, but, like I say, they haven't been in the country much of it. Have we been travelling a lot because we're worried that this time next year nobody will be allowed to leave the country with Brexit and what have you. <laughs> I can't believe within the first 10 minutes of a new podcast for a new season, you've mentioned that Brexit word. Um, hey, you don't know, do you? Do you know what I mean? But, you know, from, what, from what happened, um, we the Kickers, a great name for a football club, um, Kickers, I don't know what their first name is, I just keep referring to them as the Kickers. Um, it's Offenbach, and I've probably done a disservice to the German there, and Mark's probably going to be laughing his head off. Um, but, yeah, maybe it is, but... Um, Get out. The thing is, though, with free trade, we could go anywhere, couldn't we? We could go to India, we could go... Surely, surely Wally's got some, some ties there. Can you imagine that, pre-season in India? Wally is probably trying to line that one up now. If he is allowed back in the country, I don't know what happened there, back when he joined us around the time of whatever that th Twitter thing was. Let's not get into that now, because <laughs> let's try and start this season without any controversy, or controversy, however you want to say that word. Last season, I don't want to spend any much, any much, I don't want to spend any time on this really, Stu, but last season, as we all know, became such a slog, didn't it? And really became, it got all very serious, didn't it? And it was not much fun for you, was not much some fun, was not much fun for me. There you go. You can tell I'm getting my mistakes in early, getting them out of the way in the first five minutes of the season on the podcast. But it became stressful and difficult. 
and awkward and it was just not a nice experience. So this season, hopefully, we're going to have a little bit more fun, get to get back to what football should really be about, I think. Is that fair? Yeah, I agree. Um, I think you and I have made a conscious decision to wrap up the podcast as soon as the season finished. Um, I don't know how many, how many weeks it's been now, but it must be, what, a good eight to ten weeks that we've had a break at least. Um, and I don't know about you, but I needed it. I think a lot of the fans needed it. Um, my batteries are recharged. Actually, the good thing about pre-season being not in this country is actually I've not seen much of the football. Um, my, my first... So I say I saw the I saw the home friendlies, but then there was a break. Um, but I was at Met Police on Tuesday night, and um, I felt refreshed. Actually, I felt refreshed. There's a a bit of a buzz about the squad, even though we can't win many of the games, but that's due to opposition. Um, but yeah, it was. I I remember talking to uh, a couple of people at Met Police actually on Tuesday night, and I I blatantly said that I'd celebrated Bradford for about thirty seconds, I think. And then all I thought about was, great, we can get rid of the squad that we don't really want and we can rebuild. And Wally's tried his best to do that during the summer. Yeah, we're going we're to come on, when we get to talking about pre-season results and performances and what have you, we're going to come on to the squad and what's changed and who's left and who's come in. There's a few bits and pieces we want to wrap up or cover before we get to that. But actually, the very first talking point I've got on the list on this somewhat of a script slash format we have put together we start the season with all good intentions don't we with scripts and everything and then by the time we get to november just like whatever just find an hour that we can actually sit down and record the thing um but it is personnel that we'll start with two names let's start with toby civic so he has departed Uh, we talk about not being able to leave the country next season because of brexit toby's found a way not out the country but certainly back in time because he's joined barnsley which i think has just reached um, i was last in barnsley i think in the year 2001 in that's london 2001 barnsley had reached 1975 by that point so i don't know what year they're up to now but i mean i was surprised i was very surprised the rumor is three hundred thousand pounds is that correct have i got that right i don't pay attention during pre-season so i'm going on hearsay yeah i think yeah i think rumored obviously it's undisclosed which a lot of transfers are nowadays um yeah i think it's about that i'm hoping we've got some sell-ons as well I think the offer was too good to the offer was too good to turn down. You know, we we we're going to come on to the next player where we didn't accept a bid last summer, and that caused us all sorts of problems and and stuff like that. But um, yeah, fair play to Toby. I don't think it's interesting to know whether he was. I don't think he'd been under any pressure to accept the deal from Barnsley. Um, and you know, obviously he was up at Barnsley, up at Oakwell um, last season, wasn't he? When we went there and got a goalless draw, so he would he would have known the area, but. You're right. Barnsley is basically the place that time forgot. Um, it's yeah, it's an old mining. T- it's an old mining town. It's basically Sheffield to turn right. Um, and if he's got any sense, it reminds me when um, Jake Reeves signed up for Bradford, uh, and when we chatted to him, there was no way he was staying in Bradford. He stayed in Leeds because that's obviously got some. Leeds is a lovely city, to be fair. It's just north, um, but um, I'd imagine. Toby will be staying in Sheffield, um, but he's fair play to him, you know, because he's 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 obviously moving away from his family, his friends, um, and it shows it shows obviously it was the right move. He's taking it seriously. He he will develop. He's got all the athletic um, attributes that you need, but the deal's good for us, and the deal was no doubt good for him. Yeah, you've touched on my feelings on the subject. He is an athlete. They've bought an athlete there, haven't they? I think we talked last season about him and. It is a test of their coaching, I think, now to develop him and get him to use his brain a little bit more. He's got the pace, certainly. Uh, he does seem to have a natural ability, but when he has, when it comes time for him to have to think about what he's doing, that's where it seems to have, or seems to fall apart for him. So they'll do a good job with him. Or they're going to have to if they're going to turn him into a genuine championship footballer. I imagine we're probably going to come up against him, or League One or League Two teams will be this season. I imagine a loan deal is in his future over the next nine months. Yeah, but do you know what? I don't know. He may go... It's championships are a big move, isn't it, in terms of that side of it? Um, but we have to remember, he was 19. You know, he's just turned 20. He turned 20 in the May. So he, last season, he was, you know, just turned 19 going into the season. And I think he's actually more intelligent than what I think people give him credit for. Um, 
But he's still learning. You know, he's still learning on the job. And this is what we had to, you know, learn last season. We had we had players who were learning on the job. Paul Cannon, Bay, Toby Civic, um, Anthony Hartigan. You can still say that was the case with it. And whereas when you loan them out, and you're right. You know, Barnsley may try and loan them out. I'm not too sure. I think it will probably be a, a, a competition for wherever they're going to play. If they're going to play a three-five-two, or they're going to play a right back, I don't think you can defend. Um, but I think you know. Players are making errors. Normally you loan them out and they make errors with other teams. But as we saw, they make errors in our team. Um, and we have to take roughly smooth. So, you know what, he's only 20. He's got a lot to He's got all the right attributes. And um, good luck to him. And um, I just hope we've got to, I just hope we've got to sell on fees because I've, I've, I've got a feeling that he will be sold for a profit in years to come. What about Deji? Joined on a free to Charlton Athletic. What do you make of that one? Good luck to him. Um, he obviously tried out Luton and realised that he don't want to be anywhere near that club. Um, I'm joking. <laughs> um, Clearly yeah. having some form of issue there, Deji. <laughs> Someone mentioned it to me last um, on Tuesday night, actually, at Met Police, that it could have been some brinkmanship or some gamesmanship from Deji in terms of maybe Charlton was stalling a little bit and he used Luton, he used Luton as purely a, a pawn in, in that transfer deal. Do you know what I mean? Or, I don't know whether Luton really wanted him. If I'm being honest with you, I think Luton, if you look at Luton and Charlton, I think Luton have the more potential to get better players than no they disrespect to Deji. But Charlton are going to feed off the scraps of players that are probably good enough for a League One championship, you know, championship challenge or playoff challenge. And they will, they will acquire those players and try and do what probably Burton did. Um, and try and, well, I think they're, they're a bigger club than Burton. But they would try and stay up with a, with a low budget because they're, they're obviously their owner doesn't like spending any money. Um, but good luck to Deji. Um, I'm frustrated. With, I'm not frustrated with Deji. I'm just frustrated with the fact that we've lost another player on a free um, to a club. And yeah, I mean, it's frustrating. That's the key to it, isn't it? We had bids, or we turned down bids for him last season. And on reflection, we really could have done with that money. I mean, we're going to come on to stage and financing in a bit because we'll talk about the money that Toby Civic has brought in and perhaps where that's best allocated. And lots of these topics today will cross over in different parts of the podcast. And then Deji, what we heard from Ipswich back this time last year, 400,000 was the rumour. That's a significant chunk we could have taken off of our stadium financing. Yeah. Do you know what? It's, it's, that's another... That's another um, that's a different topic altogether in terms of where we just put the money. I'm, a, I'm very much. I know you're a bit worried about how we're going to finance the stadium. Um, I don't really want to sell players to play pay off the stadium. If that makes any sense, I'd rather whatever we whatever we get in revenue from players in terms of what profit we make on the playing side, I would like to go back into the squad. If I'm being honest with you, unless of course we can't get a roof on a stand at Plough Lane, and we've got to do it that way. Um, but yeah, I think with Deji, there's so many stories going around and no one's really come out and confirmed either way. Um, whether they should do it or not, I don't know. But, you know, rumour is that we played hardball at, at its switch and we wanted more money and we were trying to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. And in the end, they went, do one and sent him back. Um, that's the rumour. Well, Deji's, the way Deji come back and the form he displayed, he was obviously a player that was going through those sort of motions of, I didn't get my move that I wanted. And no matter how much of a professional you are, dead he is, that will always affect you. Um, but hopefully we've got around, you know, we sold, you know, just going back to Toby, we sold him the moment we got a decent bid that matched our valuation, we sold. That's what we've got to do. You know, Piggott's the same. You get a, you get a bid, you let the player know out of respect. If it matches your club's valuation, you sell. End of, do you know what I mean? You, there's, no, there's no sentiment in, unless it's Lyle Taylor, of course. The... Issue with stadium financing, though, though, I know what you're saying, and I agree totally with the Deji situation and taking the money when it's offered and meet your valuation. We do now have to think about the stadium financing, though. Um, we've got a target. We're trying to crowdfund with the help of Cedars, are the name of the company that are leading on this one, the crowdfunding. The costs have gone up. Um, perhaps it was a little naive of all of us. I, I mean that in terms of everybody myself in that thinking when we first heard cost projections that things were going to perhaps stay around that mark they haven't they've escalated um we are now looking to crowdfund seven million pounds we have to raise 13 million my understanding is six million of that from loans seven million through crowdfunding i think that's optimistic i think we're going to need some big sponsors 
lined up to help us get over that line or big investors, fans that have lots of money, but also companies that aren't fans that can invest hundreds of thousands, if not millions into it. Because I think we, I mean, on the website, it says they broke it down very nicely, which was in real terms, that's 300 pounds from every one of the 23,000 fans we took to Wembley. Well, we're dreaming if we think <laughs> every single one of those 23,000 fans is going to stump up 300 pounds. Um, I don't think I am in the position to do that. I don't think my 14-year-old niece is in a position to do that. You can see where I'm going to go down this line with whoever was there. I think Mark's six-year-old son is going to diff- find it difficult to stump up and so on, so on, so on. So for me, and I know you talk about money coming in for players and it being reinvested in the squad, but it does say if we can't raise this money, which is a huge target, then the natural thing that's going to happen is it's going to take money away from the squad and the playing budget. I think we might already be seeing that, to be honest with you, this season. We've got lots to talk about finances in that regard. 300,000, had we got 400,000 for Dead Josh Larger, that's 700,000 pounds. That's 10% of our target done. So for me, do I sacrifice playing budget at this point? Yes, I think so, because I think we're in a bit of trouble in regards to this stadium finance. Yeah. Joe, it's interesting. I think the club are being, I think the club are being very coy about, or the Don Trust board and the club are being very coy about Cedars and stuff like that. Um, I was at the meeting that was that launched the, you know, so the Buckingham group were there about the stadium and Cedars did the, did the second half of um, their, obviously, fundraising, the fund, of what it's called now. Um, Crowdfunding. That's the word. That's the word. What I would say, though... I was. What struck me was how there wasn't any desperation from anybody. So Mark Davis, who spoke about it, the chairman from Cedars, um, even the Buckinghamshire group, and they were doing the stadium. They were talking about what was going to be done. They never felt to me like there was any desperation in terms of well, we might get this if we get two million from Cedars, or we might get this if we get four million. It wasn't broken down that way. Which maybe I'm being foolhardy here, but maybe I, I feel that we have. We, we know, you know, people that know Wimbledon um, area we know that it's a very affluent area. Um, and if anyone, anyone sees who the Don, if anyone goes as a Don's Draws member, as a Don's Draw member, they will see a few familiar names who win quite regularly. And the reason for that is they put a bit of money into the club and that's how they put money in. But they have more than that. And I'm not going to name names, but that's just, a, I'll leave it there for you. Um, but I feel that we... In the backdrop, we know that we have got some some significant investors, and the rest is to baby beef it up. That maybe I'm being naive, but, yeah, but I I, I, didn't, I never saw any desperation from them. And you know, seven million pounds is a lot of money, you know. And as they broke it down, three hundred pound per every person that went to Wembley. Um, yeah, that I get it, but I don't I don't think we're going to have to rely on that. But call me foolhardy, but I think we've we've got a significant amount of that investment lined up. If we haven't. We're going to have to start. It'd be like if you go shopping at Tesco's or obviously all, all other good um, supermarkets are available. Um, but if you go there and you go to the cash out and actually when you get there, you haven't got the money, you have to put maybe a can of baked beans back or get a saver, go get a saver can of baked beans and start, you know, basically just saying, oh, I can't afford that, I can't afford that, I can't afford that. A saver can of baked beans. The mind have, you ever, have you ever had them? <laughs> From I have like, I buy Sainsbury's own baked beans because they're yeah. like 30p and they taste just as good yeah my wife did it once and she just basically cut down on what all the all the brands and i had it and i was like this is lovely and then she told me it was safer and of course your mind goes what i don't buy them anymore i do try i do like heinz so i'm a bit of a person on that but do you know what i mean i think we're gonna i think you know we might go to the stadium and cash out and in the end we might have to go i uh, can't do that or go actually do you know what i've got another credit card here and that's basically because i've sold joe piggott to reading for i'm saying uh, just to clarify, you're talking about, about what different people and representatives of different groups are saying. This was at a this was the Don's Trust meeting that was, when was that, June, was it? June, July? Well, we're in July. Um, June, May? It was, it, was, it was before pre-season started, wasn't it? Before me and manager, so it must have been, I think it was early June. Okay. Um, but, yeah, like I say, no desperation. We don't know. No. There's big conversation to be had about state and financing. I'm sure we're going to have many more conversations about it. This is just to catch up with it and we are already in the first 25 minutes of the new season running late but sounding great Milton Keynes very quickly oh, on this one oh dear this was <laughs> all we know is mediation has not finished 
This mediation is still continuing. We do not know the end result of it. As it stands, what appears to be the case is we're being told we have to refer to them as, I don't want to say it, we have to refer to it as their, I guess it's their legally registered name, I suppose. In full, we do not have to display their badge anywhere. That is what appears to be the case. We know nothing more than that at this time. Puts us on a little bit of a weak negotiating position, I think, if we are already agreeing to um, comply with certain regulations, because the obvious end game of that is, well, if you did it for this game that we weren't expecting to happen in the League Cup in August, then why can't you do it for future games? There isn't really an argument there. Must be said, though, what an absolute pain in the backside it is having to play them twice in basically the first month of the season. It's a pain in the backside having to play them at all. The League Cup game, interesting. But I noticed that tickets have gone on sale, but it's nothing to do with season ticket holders getting priority or collecting their usual seats. It's just unallocated seating. So obviously we're not expecting a great number of people to turn up for it. Don't know what security is going to be like for it. I do know that Wally Downs is unlikely to be quite as, shall we say, in inverted commas, professional as previous management were in their discussions or their behaviours during these fixtures. I could be wrong on that one completely, but I doubt it somehow. No, I don't think you are. There's, there's a couple of points. Yeah, there's a couple of questions or points within that, isn't there? Um, I think, hey, look, I think, um, I wouldn't say the EFL got caught out, but I think we got caught out in terms of we didn't expect to be drawing them in a cut competition first round. But those famous, those famous, famous, famous warm balls, as they called it, for the draw, look like it's worked again. We go, I don't know how the hell we keep drawing them. Um, I really don't. But that seems to have caught us out, doesn't it? Because obviously mediation was in the progress and um, our home fixture against them was right at the end of the season. Um, so you, you have to think that the Football League had some influence in that in terms of us not going to be at home when we get the mediation um, done. But you're right. Um, unfortunately, we've shown our hand. It's like Brexit, isn't it? I know we mentioned that twice in the first half hour. But if you're not prepared to if you're not prepared to walk without a deal or mediation, then you've shown your hand and basically you ain't going to get back to the table because why, why should they? Why, you know, unfortunately, we have shown our hand. We've shown now what we will can do. Um, and I think it'd be very difficult to go back from that. Um, I think my only frustration really was that um, I think there was a tweet, wasn't there, where we displayed their full legal name on a tweet. And I don't know how you break the news to to us because it's not easy because obviously the reaction, is, the reaction has been quite strong. Um, some don't care. Some don't want to move on. I'm a little bit... Um, I thought I didn't care too much. However, the amount of times I keep seeing their full name on everything and I've got my ticket for the game and it has their full name on it, I just want to throw it in the bin. Um, so that's a difficult one. Um, in terms of, um, if you want something else up now, I've forgotten what it was. What did we discuss on that? So, so in the name um, fixture, yeah, you mentioned something. Wally Downs. That's it. Him. That could be a problem. <laughs> so, Wally is no shrinking violet. Um, definitely with that. And yes, Neil and Neil and Neil, um, from my personal point of view, showed too much um, courtesy. Yeah, courtesy, love, respect. Love? Well, it felt like a bit, a bit of a loving sometimes, didn't it? Um, yeah, it was uncomfortable. But when, I, when it first happened, the first game, I thought that maybe they had maybe been instructed to, because what you don't want is a war on the pitch and a war on the touchline, because that just basically just sets it all off. However, Wally is a Wimbledon man, like Neil was, but Wally isn't frightened of getting involved in a bit of a row, and I think... I think he knows how much it means to the club and he's obviously been made aware of um, Neil's reaction with a certain manager there last time. So, hmm, be interesting to see on the touchline. But, hey, look, it's a League Cup game. No one turns up for League Cup. No one turns up from their club anyway to our place because they're not fans that even believe they should travel out of their own little roundabouts. So, hey, look, it's just a, it's just an inconvenience. That's, that's, that's the worst now. We will revisit this subject closer to the time of that League Cup fixture. Very quickly, green kit, yes or no? Love it. Yeah, I'm a fan, I must admit. It's the first Puma kit that I'm going to be buying. So really? I'm very, very, yeah, I don't, I've not liked the previous three. Last season's new home and away collars on football kits. I think I made one exception for the white kit because that was a bit of a ceremonial, mm. not an anniversary, but a celebratory kit. Yeah. It was a monumental kit. 
Otherwise, no, I'm not a fan of collars on football kits. Uh, this Puma kit, I think it actually makes us look like a professional outfit stepping out in that stuff, which I'm not sure our current other two kits do. They look a bit cheap if you want my honest opinion. But there we go. I shall be spending my money on that one. And well, I say, you already have. Well, yeah, I have. I, I got it. Well, actually, you know, my wife bought it for me, actually, which was nice for her. Um, until I didn't tell how much it was, <laughs> which is quite funny. Um, I told her how much the, the kid. I told her how much the children's one was because um, Matt in the club shop. Um, I'd, I'd moaned, not moaned. I'd, I'd expressed a, a disappointment of how much children kits were, especially like one to twos, etc. And the price had come down this year. I think it was twenty quid. Um, I think it was about twenty six, twenty seven last year. Um, but of course, the home kit has gone up. Um, well, I didn't know that until she bought it. All I say is don't go into Asda's because they think you work in there. Um, don't go into Asda at all, actually. Just, obviously, just don't say. go into Asda wearing the shirt, but they, they might think you're on the checkout. And secondly, um, there is a kit coming. There is a new walkout jacket being launched for the start of the season, I think the first home game, which I have been told... <laughs> Is that what is that what our fans can wear when they leave with twenty minutes to go <laughs> in frustration? Is that what that is? Well, we know with last year we like we like the you know the, the light blue walkout kits. We did obviously mm. I, well, I did anyway. I like um, I, I liked the actual product. Yes, I don't like the idea of walking out in tracksuit tops. No, I don't. It's just a bit pompous, doesn't it? It looks like your Premiership mm. club. Yeah. Um, but then we went on VAR, so we're not going to be that Premiership next year um, or this no, not next year this season, of course, isn't it? Um, but yeah, just so quickly, uh, Matt, Matt sort of said to me, it's coming out and it's supposed to be really, really nice. So um, get yourself down to the club shop. Got some great stuff in the club shop this season. Can't wait for the new stadium when we get more space for a club shop. But anyway, yeah. another conversation for another day. Right. Um, we were going to touch on Meet the Manager. That might come up during the main... Com- main. I can't even get my words out. It's first season nerves. First season? First episode nerves. It's, it's yeah, still warming up. Getting my vocal cords ready. Um Meet the Manager stuff will come up as we discussed pre-season. So, um, where do we start with pre-season? Well, the first, first thing is I'm going to say is we went on Facebook, didn't we? Facebook.com slash 9YRS podcast. And we're going to be doing this a lot this season. We want your views on the show. We keep talking about being a fans club. Well, we are a f- podcast of a fans club. Therefore, we are a fans podcast and we want the views of the fans. So we're going to be seeking your comments a lot more regularly this season. So look out on Facebook for questions that we're going to put up on there. But, of course, you can message us at any time. You can slide into our DMs on Twitter at 9YRS Podcast. You can message us on Facebook. Again, facebook.com slash 9YRS Podcast. Email us, 9YRS at may14.co.uk. That's 9YRS at may14.co.uk. We want to get your views. And so we put on Facebook asking people, what about pre-season? What had most impressed you and what had most worried you about what you had seen in pre-season for me i had none of these because i don't do pre-season because it sucks but we have a few comments that we're going to go through and, and work our way through i suppose i should prefix this by saying however Stu, that pre-season begins of course with players in and out and we talked about some squad changes now by my reckoning well let's start with the outs apart from the lone players ramsdale said and did not return for has come back in I'm not sure Watford, I'm going to have to learn to deal with it. I'm going to have to learn to live with it. Um, Nathan Trott, goalkeeper, young goalkeeper from West Ham. I think that is correct, isn't it? On loan for the season. Other than that, Nesta Guinness-Walker has come in from the Met Police. That's why I imagine we had a friendly with them on Tuesday evening. Adam Rosgrow from the Welsh League. And Luke O'Neill, formerly of Gillingham, I believe. Full-back, right-back, perhaps would not have come in if Sibic was still here. We don't know that for certain. Um, seems quite thin on the ground. We lost a lot of players. I told you Ramsdale and Seddon had gone, James Hansen gone, Andy Bartram gone. Bartram not yet found a club, I don't believe. We knew Tyler Bury was going, Alfie Egan. These are the main ones. There are some other youngsters as well. Joe McDonnell and Tom Saws, of course, didn't renew his contract. Uh, Leon Trotter had already left. So it seems a lot more outs than ins. Seems like we are really... We were, we were a young side last season. We're arguably even younger and more inexperienced this season when you look at who's come in as opposed to who's gone out. And then pre-season's been a bit of a mixed bag. Well, not mixed bag. A lot of defeats in there. I don't think... I don't read too much into results in pre-season. I think, as I said, the only time I did was when we had that horrendous one under Terry Brown where it really looked bad. I'm not too bothered by results or anything like this at this stage, but I am interested in what those people who have been to pre-season have thought and what their views are. Very quickly, let's start with you. And um, before we get to the listeners, what 
has been your biggest concern, but what has also been, well, what has most impressed you so far in what has been, what, two wins from eight games in pre-season? Yeah, so concerns, um, I still, yeah, the squad is still a little, I think it still lacks um, some senior pros. Um, so I did the Bristol City, Brentford games at home, and I did obviously the Met Police. Um, and very much at the start of the season, we just didn't have a much, you know, see, what I mean by senior pros is just people that have got a league experience. Um, you know, we, we brought a lot of kids in, uh, you know, we brought in a lone goalkeeper from West Ham. Um, he's got a thankless task next season. Um, you know, the season before that, whoever replaced George Long was going to have a thankless task. And we, we may, well, obviously we had um, King come in initially and that didn't work out. Uh, and then, uh, you know, obviously we had Ramsdale come in and, well, we all know how good he was. So Trot's got a lot to do. And unfortunately, people were, judge- uh, people were being very judgmental early on with him. Um, I think he'll be fine. He's, he's very, um, very thin. Um, he's got a great leap on him in terms of coming out of the balls. He took out Ron McDonald with a were coming out for a ball right on the edge of the area, actually, on Tuesday night. Um, he dives like Superman. Um, you'll have to see it. To, um, I said it to a few people on Tuesday night, and they looked at me like, in total, like, what are you on about? But look at him when he dives. He dives like Superman. I'll leave it there uh, on that side of it. So, yeah, my concerns are, um, will, will the fans give uh, Trot the... He needs time. He needs time. He's not going to come and do a Ramsdale on that side of it. Um, positive points for this season... <laughs> I would probably say Nesta, uh, Nesta Guinness Walker. Um, I, I heard early on that he was going to have to fight for a place, and by judging by how people reacted to him, I think he's probably probably nailed that. But he's probably nailed down that position for the start of the season. Um, coming with a lot of confidence, he does try and play out from the back. Um, we're going to play a three-five-two next season, um, and you're we. And, uh, from what I've seen, we're playing very high with our wing, our full backs or wing backs. So we've got Nesta Guinness Walker who wants to go forward probably more than Seddon did last year. Uh, and Luke O'Neill kept Barry Fuller out of the right back position there, and Barry Fuller had to move to left back. So that probably tells you a little bit of that. Great free kick, free kick taker. Um, I think we get goals from him, decent cross. Again, plays very high. Um, so yeah, they're the plus points. For Levy, uh, I'm not saying it just because he's a Watford loney. Nick, I assure you, but he's come. He's come back pre-season, and he looks like um, he's looking really good. Looking really good. Looking like that, that loan deal did him a world of good. Gave him that confidence, and it's just really who who he pairs with. Because everyone's talking about his number nine, and number nine normally is a target man or a big lad, and we haven't really got that. Felivi, as we know from last season, will drop into holes on midfield and and pick balls up, and once he gets that, he can run at people. He's been he's been really good pre season, so um yeah, we've done well there, but we've still got probably another four to get on top of anything that we obviously have to replace if we lose anybody. And forwards has been something that I have picked up on in terms of goals and lack of goals, and this is something that is worrying people. So turning to Facebook, as I mentioned, I probably went too early with that reference about Facebook and contacting us, didn't I? But hey. This is what pre-season is for. It's all for warming warming up and getting back into the swing of things. So on Facebook, some of these comments. Uh, let's start with let's start with Jeff Bannertime because he sort of says not scoring and conceding loads. Why on earth would anyone have any concerns? It does seem what worries you more at this stage, Stu? Is it the lack of scoring or is it the conceding too many? Results mean nothing. <laughs> I'm being true. I know it sounds unless you're getting results. Too, but if there are patterns in terms of like conceding lots of goals then like Terry Brown that last pre-season of his that's that's where you start to ask questions isn't it yeah there is and you know we keep losing games 3-2 don't we so what I would say to you is if you're going to put a bet on put over more than five goals and you do quite well next season um, of course we don't do betting and don't encourage that at all um, that's <laughs> betting partners <laughs> is definitely a conversation we'll be having on the podcast in the next um, couple of months what I was saying, and not to be not to be flippant or anything like that, results don't matter. Um, we haven't played a. Re- if you look at all the pairings we play, we haven't played the same team. We've mixed a match for fitness and, and stuff like that. So a lot of the goals, not goals I've seen, are just basically communication. Um, especially when you're going to try, especially when you're going to try and play three five two, because basically it means that your centre halves have basically got to make sure they're picking up. Sometimes they won't be marking anybody. Um, and that is going to be learning, you know, learning on a job. I suppose my concern is is that we haven't had that three at the back in terms of that free the pairing that the trio. We haven't 
really had that consistently. And because of how important the free is, my concern is pattern of play is what we're struggling at. And we saw a bit on Tuesday night at Met Police. Um, there was a there was a situation where I think Will went not Will sorry I think um, Paul Cannon Bay went out too too deep, uh, too high went out, got played in around the corner and all of a sudden someone was in straight in goal. So it's about patterns and play. That would be my main concern. But we you know we're not playing. We're playing so many different variations of forwards and that. I'm not surprised we're not looking great up front. I'm not overly concerned at the moment. If we lose at Hampton, then let's revisit it. You mentioned mix and matching and not getting pairs and trios and what have you. It's a point that Matt Harwood raised earlier today with me. He said, still concerned that we have not put out our first choice 11 yet. Um, yeah, it does seem... Is that sensible? Is it sensible in pre-season to mix and match as regularly as we have? What have we got left? Hampton and Palace, so two more games. Is that where we expect to see a, the coming together of the first choice lineup, and that's where you get your pattern and play and your shape and all those relationships across the pitch together? I think it'll be Palace game. I don't think it'll be Hampton because we had no Wordsworth, Wagstaff, Piggott um, at um, Met Police on Tuesday. There's a few so others as well. That that's play. leaving us one pre-season, and that's against a Premier League team. It is. I'll tell you where I'm a bit more... I think what we have to do... This isn't preaching, by the way, but I think what we have to trust in Wally. I think we have to trust that what he did last season um, basically means why we're in League 2. Let's be honest with you, Johnny. Him and, him and Glenn put why? something together. We're not in League 2. Sorry, League 1. I forgot our league we're in then. <laughs> oh, dear. League 1. We are doing, we're definitely in League 1. Um, but we, I think we have to trust Wally. And what I would um, sort of balance it against is... I think I've said this before. You know, Wally... In India, every year he, he, he spoke about meeting the manager and many interviews that he did when he first joined, is that each year they would have a new group of players. And because obviously he was in India, I think they would have, uh, I think, say a squad of 20, I think they could only have three or four um, non-Indian players. So he every, every year he had a new squad and he had to blend that squad in and get them to play, to, play with each other. That's basically, yeah, OK. Professional, is, as, as I said, Nick. Um, but they have to... I think, so what I'm saying to you is, I'm just, <laughs> I'm my I'm words. just recollect, recollecting <laughs> the image of Will Nightingale and Anthony Hartigan in the eyes. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah that's Sorry, just, excuse me about my a, juvenile attitude, everybody. Yeah. I am only 25. It's a great picture. So what I mean by that is I think we have to trust Wally that he, he sort of has done this before. He's played a lot. You know, this preseason has been so different in terms of tours and and the mix and matching and the amount of games. You know, I don't think we've ever played, what, I think we're close to 10 games we're going to be played by the time we, we line up against Rotherham at home. Um, so I think we just have to trust the process, really. And um, Wally didn't look too bothered on Tuesday night. Um, you might have seen a picture that we sent with Wally in sandals. Hilarious. Wally just uh, Wally's fashion sense is just is is amazing. I think even Glenn was I think even Glenn was trying not to laugh, but he doesn't look bothered. Um, yeah, one game. You're right, one game. But I think you'll find that all players will be fit. They they do look fit, um, and we just have to trust the process. He's I think he's earned that trust from last season, um, I would have thought. OK, let me run through then more of these comments, correspondence that we've had. So I'm actually going to start with um, Jason Barrett, just to continue a theme very quickly. We won't talk about it more than this, but this is what Jason said. He said, the lack of goals from non-strikers is possibly the worst in any division or was the worst in any division last season. Don't seem to have rectified that during pre-season. Opposition seem to take this into account, as the Pig and Felivi always had at least two markers constantly around them. Also, Rossgrove looks out of his depth. He'd rather see Wood on the bench. <laughs> Sorry, that's me being June on um, I think it's a bit harder, Roscoe. Um, I think, you know, the games I saw him was against Bristol City and Brentford. And let's be honest with you, they're, they're, cha- they're decent championship. They're what? They're going to be top-half championship clubs, aren't they? Um, and you're asking a guy coming in from a university team in, in Wales to go up against you know, established defenders of that, even though, even though it's pre-season. Um, I think it's a bit harsh. I think, again, we just we have to give these guys a chance. You know, We played really tough teams in pre-season. I think Roscoe's strengths are that he plays on the shoulder of defenders, so he's always trying to get in and behind and turn, which I like. We didn't really have that last year. Piggott didn't really, Piggott didn't really want to turn defenders, really. Um, Pye would rather come short. Felivi would rather come short. Hansen didn't play enough, really. He was a target man. Um, so I think it's a bit harsh on, on Roscoe. Um, here's a project. As Waddy said, he scored a 1,000 odd goals in, in Wales. So, you know, he's, he's a player that, you know, if, if it don't work out, what have we lost? Not much. 
you know, but going back to you, you know, just to give you a little bit of a sort of a, an idea of where we are with that, look at, we didn't look at um, Lowe, who was at Hampton and Richmond, who reportedly now we're going to value him around about 7 million quid. So we're taking chances on players. So you might, for our say, take 10 forwards in from non-league or sort of them sort of areas, and you might only get two or three, that, two, three, four that actually really do work for you. But to, you know, you know, to go back to your stadium fund, if we've got a low from Hampton and Richmond, we now will probably paid off that £7 million that we need to, to find. Yes, wouldn't that have been nice? Um, moving on, Paul Sawyer simply says, Nesta... Guinness Walker, obviously, sounds good, but the lack of goals worries me as we struggled last season as well. Andrew Rutledge agrees. Nesta looks like he has really good potential. And again, you're mentioning there, Stu, potentially a player that we can move on for a big fee. I also really like the look of um, Osu as well. Might be too soon for him. Binnan Williams, who was a trialist, I think, so not earned rave reviews from what I've heard. Luke O'Neill could provide the experience we're talking about that we're missing at the back centre midfield is solid but lacks creativity other than Hartigan I think that is going to be an issue I think that's why maybe Felivi comes into us this season just off the striker making things happen between the lines we shall see two good wingers that are again going to have trouble getting into the starting lineup. concerned about a lack of goals keeps recurring theme here especially if something happens to pig no longer have a target man so playing direct could be a problem we're strong at centre back but can those players give us goals from set pieces that would be a good target for next season. Hmm. Um, think, James, yeah. sorry, go on. No, I was just going to, I think what I was going to say was, last set, I think the, the lack of goals and people worrying about that is simply because we couldn't score at the end of last season and we got into pre-season looking the same. You know, the goals we scored haven't really been open play, they've been penalties, etc. But what I would say is the three-five-two that he's trying to play and he said he's going to play that, with the, you know, with Nesta, I think with the, f- the wing backs that we've got, they're going to play very high. I think at home game. So, you know, there was and this was Met Police. So, you know, it's very difficult. But you're still going to try things out. That you're probably going to do at home uh, against the team. And we play very high. So actually, your wingers are not really going to be. I do. I do struggle to f- understand where we're going to fit in um, Pinnock next year and also Connolly. I don't see how they fit into a three-five-two. But I think it's a different. I think a three-five-two this season. One thing I did notice is we got a lot more players into the box um, than we did last year, and that was our biggest problem. We didn't get forwards into the area. If you don't get people into the areas, you don't score goals because otherwise you're looking for wonder goals. I would, I may come back to haunt me, but I wouldn't worry about goals. I don't think we're going to be as boring as we were last year. This formation to me does look like it's got a lot of good points to it, but we just have to understand the opposition we played and the mix and match we've done. It's hardly a surprise, and I don't think it's about the results, and it's not being flippant. It's more about them being fit and ready to go. James Whitaker says his only concern is the board haven't given Wally anywhere near the playing budget that Neil had. He says it hope it doesn't cost us this season. He did a truly amazing job to keep us up last season. Two or three more proven League One slash two standard players, we'd be in much better position, but Trot still concerns him hugely. And then... Robert Boyce says he has three main concerns. Strike force, nowhere near. So I know you've just said that about scoring goals, but Robert Boyce says strike force is nowhere near as good as our League Two playoff strike force. That is true, in my opinion, as well. I agree. In fact, our squad signings are no better than last year's squad. Again, agree. Desperate lack of target man. Yes, I will agree with these. Looking for someone to buy Quezzy Apaya. We've not mentioned him yet. I think we might have a conversation about Quezzy next week. Other concern for me is Trot. Also a little concern over Trot. Looks small, but again, filling Ramsdale's shoes, it's always hard, wouldn't it? Um, Last concern is Pinnock. A couple of people have mentioned this. Matt Howard mentioned Pinnock as well. It's a bit of a worry. Started off his career with us. Looked like a League One Gareth Bale, but always seems to be out and about, shall we say. Comes across as a bad influence, in his opinion. Positives are Nesta, Felivi and... He hopes 300,000 goes from Toby Civic Sale goes to Wally Downs. Mitch Pinnock is a, he's a fascinating character. And I think he's got, I think what normally happens is when you sign a player like him, and you saw it with Joe Pickett when he first joined, and you'll see it with Nesta currently, is when you sign a player from non-league, similar to when an academy graduate gets into the first team squad, everyone gets behind them, wishes them well, wants to see them do really, really well. This season, 
Mitch Pinnock hasn't got that. People are asking questions of him, wondering what he contributes. So really, we're expecting him this season to really knuckle down, aren't we? And prove what quality he has got. I mean, if he doesn't do it this season, is he here next season? I don't think so. Yeah, well, we paid a fee for him, didn't we? Because we obviously went to a tribunal because we couldn't agree a fee with Dover. Um, some people rightly said that he won player of the year playing centre midfield for Dover. Um, so he's obviously played there before, but we obviously know that's a level, it's a conference level. So um, it's obviously t- tougher than the levels you go up. Um, Pinnock's his own worst enemy because he loves social media. <laughs> I wish sometimes we might have a little bit of a word with him and just... It's just being smart, isn't it, John you know, On one hand, we want players, we want to see what players are doing, but on the on the other hand, is when they're doing too much and not the things we like, we then moan. So, as fans, we're a little bit guilty of you know trying to encourage them to do more and moaning when they're not doing it. Um, I think we're trying to find. I think we're trying to make him into a midfielder um, because I think obviously the formation we're going to play isn't going to suit him. You know, Pinnock in a four four two, I like because Pinnock is an old fashioned winger, touch, uh, you know, touch out of his feet and into an area. Um, if you have a target man, that's fine. But, you know, Piggott's, Piggott is not one that's going to get pace and get goal side on a, on a centre-half. He's he's more than one working it, working it around the angles and he gets his space that way. He's not really a pace a pace player that will just run, you know, if you think about it through the leagues, there's, there's a few like Hawkins at Pompey and uh, and Michael Smith, can, you know, he's got a bit of pace and can do that. But, you know, Pinnock can't do that. But I think Pinnock, I think it's very much a season of him finding a, a role in the midfield. Um, I just don't know if he has the fitness. If I'm being honest with you, he's he's been huffing and puffing. He's not been alone in that. But the problem is, um, because he's so fair-skinned, is that when he is red, he looks very red. You know, it reminds me of a boxer. There's some boxers that whenever they get hit, they straight away cut or they, they get red marks around their face. And that's Pinnock, unfortunately, because he just shows when he's, he's blowing out of his proverbials. Um, but I don't know. I think we've gone with him because sorry, I say. Sorry, hold on. Blowing out of his proverbials. Well, like basically blowing Plural. things up. Yeah. Well, I don't know. What's you know? What I want you know the word. I, I know. You, I know what you want. What? Sorry. Where is this going? I didn't really want to say that word, but you know, blowing out of his backside. Basically. There we go. Right. There we are. I thought you were referencing some something else when you mentioned two of them. <laughs> or plural. Um, so I think we try. I think we try. Um, but like I say, it's in a three-five-two. I just think it's. Uh, he needs to be in a good free. He needs to be in a good free in that midfield that's going to do the work that he can't do um, with Pinnock. Um, what I was going to quickly say, um, Trot. I think we just have to give Trot a start a chance. Uh, James Whitaker, I know, I know James well, and his concerns are that he's a bit thin and he hasn't played league football. You know, we look at Ramsdale. Ramsdale was his second loan, um, and they always say um, that the first loan is normally a little bit of a a feeler in terms of just getting used to playing men's football and stuff like that and your second loan is normally with a league one with trot we've sort of gone past that but again i think we have to trust the process in terms of what he has now got um, the england uh, coaches at swansea margerson margerson i think is that a word um, who's been in with pre-season training working with ashley bays i've been really impressed recommended trot it's another england under 20 goalkeeper or something like that you know Let's be fair, we're doing well with picking up these kids that have got England international experience, and that don't come cheap. So we have to give them a chance. Um, and my final point was, I think a few people said, is budget. I think we have to be careful with budget, because we've, we proved last year that chucking money after money, and you know, bad money after bad money, didn't really help us. So we, we've, got a, we've got a management team now who very much are coaches. So what he co- you know, what is a coach? Um, Glyn's a coach and also let's not forget Mark Robinson's been moved up from the under 18s is now the um, he's basically after the loans doesn't he but he's also involved with, involved with coaching as well and that's to me that's a master stroke because one thing I noticed on the Bristol City game was it Bristol City or Brentford no, the Brentford game he was at is that all of a sudden those academy kids that have got contracts during the summer they had their mentor on the bench so all of a sudden those nerves Really, it was just going up a level, but with their boss as well. And I think I think Waddy has done an absolute masterstroke with that. And I just think we're going to get there's something too carried away with budget because you know we've got you know we've got Guinness Nesta you know Nesta in I'm not calling Guinness um, we've got Nesta in next to nothing we've got Roscoe in next to nothing you know we might be lucky and get if we we've invested money in our head of recruitment to make sure that we can bring players in 
So let's let's not get carried away with budget. You know, we we probably can help our money that goes into Plough Lane, get some rough diamonds, sell them on. The model is a damn sight better than what we had last year with Neil. No disrespect, he did his court. You know, he did his five six years, but the model is different now. And I think let's not get carried away with budget. Let's look at you know, let's look at Quezzy. Let's look at James Hansen. We didn't do as much then, did it? Last few comments, Anne Marie Godfrey just asked the question. It was answered on Facebook. She asked the question about more worried about how we've gone to three different countries pre season, but we're still pushing the crowdfunding. Should have saved the cash and had a week in Blackpool. I had similar feelings about that. Matt Breach, former chairman of the Don's Trust, makes the point that the trip to Germany was arranged by an agency and cost us nothing, I believe. Don't know about the other two, but suspects similar stories. I understand there were sponsors involved in financing some of those trips and what have you. I mean, look, there are people that know the ins and outs of this that we don't know so it's very difficult to comment but you know yes sometimes i do wonder as i've said to you before Stuart, at this stage of proceedings because i'm worried about the stadium any money we can get i would actually like to push towards the stadium but that's again a conversation we'll have more in depth at another time final comment david butler simply says results they say you can get into the habit of winning hope it's not the same with losing well I actually think that's the story of last season, isn't it, in a nutshell. Under Neil, we got into the habit of losing. And then under Wally, we got into the habit of at least not losing by the end of the season. And that's what kept us up. But, uh, yeah, at the moment, lots of food for thought in regards of our fortunes for next season. Of course, June next week, we'll be doing our full season preview. And with that in mind, I'm going to cut, because we're running so late for time, I'm going to cut a whole section out of this week's podcast and we'll revisit our conversations about Berry and Bolton next week because we need to give that more time than it we will, can it will, offer it, it now. Will change in a week as well, wouldn't it? It will indeed. So with that said, we're certainly not going to trim the game out of the show, Stu. That would be ridiculous. That would be <laughs> crazy talk. We have a new game. So, oh Stu, I would like to introduce you to the game for this season as long as the players that we've made puns of in the names of the title of this game, remain here for the whole season, players slash management. And that game is Nick Zan Every Second Countdowns. (laughs) Lovely. We have two in one here. We have Nick Zanev and Wally Downs all in one game. Nick Zan Every Second Countdowns kind of works. Just a name, really. Um, Here's what here's what happens to you. I am going to give you 30 seconds. I am going to give you a list that I would like you to present to me of Wimbledon related things. And you simply have 30 seconds to name them all or as at least as many as you could get. And prior to starting, you can tell me how many you think you'd be able to get and then perhaps see if you can get all of them. So in a moment, I'm going to give you the category, but there are 10 possible answers for it. Okay. Okay. so this list There are 10 answers on... There are 10 things in this list. I want to see how many of them you can give to me within the 30 seconds, which I will start with the music that you can probably all guess what that music is going to be. I'm going to give you not any time to think about it. I'm going to give you what I'm looking for, and then I'm going to tell you when I'm going to start the music, and then we go, all right? Okay. And then you just have to list them. I will tell you yes if, when you say an answer, if it's on there. You just have to keep chucking answers at me, okay? Okay. So... I'm going to give you 30 seconds. There are 10 possible answers. They are simply, because we are still in pre-season, I would like the name, and there are 10 answers to this, possibly, the name of every team we played in our first pre-season as AFC Wimbledon. Now, how many do you think you might be able to get of that 10? Oh, in our first is pre-season. One, two, three, four. This is giving you too much time to think. You're going to go for four? You think you can get three? Yeah. Oh, my word. Well, you're going to get that easily because you've already done it in your head. So I want seven at least. All right? Okay. Your time starts now. Okay, Sutton, Wall and Hersham, uh, Bourne Wood, if I remember properly. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, how do we play after that? Uh, yes. Um, where did I visit in that season? I uh, also want to play us. Uh, Tuna Mitchum? Nope. Uh, King Stallions? Yes. Uh, King Stallions Reserves? No. Um, oh. How many did we do? Ten? Did we do, play, did we do ten pre-seasons? We did. You got five. Oh, so you well, did get the three that you said you'd get, which was pretty much, I think, borderline cheating because you already worked it out in your head before you said that. Well, yeah, because um, I cheated. And um, you got five. Do you want the others? Do you want them in list? In, in um, 
chronological order. Warner Hirsch, I remember, because they have an athletics pitch around the ground, and it was Bassey's debut. It was. Because um, someone told me he was good, and we lost 5-0. Um, oh, I can't remember where else we went. Okay, the full list then. So you got Sutton. Yes. Well, you got if, Dulwich. If I did get Sutton, let's be fair, I should walk. True. There is one I can't believe you've not got, but we'll start with Sutton, then mm. Dulwich, which you said. The third mm. one was Bromley. Ah, uh, it started with B, didn't it? Then you got Boreham Wood, which was our next one. Then Walton and Hersham, which you also got. And then the order in my mind gets a little bit muddled, but we certainly had Windsor and Eton. Okay. Leatherhead. Damn. Kingstonian, which you did say. Yeah. Wealdstone. Oh, yeah. And what was the very, very last one? I don't know. I've, I've, I've just said it if I knew it. Oh, you're going to kick yourself. Enfield Town. Oh, we won the Supporters' Cup. Yeah, you see. Ali Russell scored the winner, if I remember properly. Probably. I don't why remember. Is it I, why is it I can remember things that far back and I can't remember some of the games last season? Because we try and forget last season never happened. <laughs> from On yeah. many levels. The Enfield Cup. Is a, oh, yeah, it was a Supporters' Cup, I believe. I think, I think it was 3-2. I might be wrong with the score. Supporters' Direct, supporters direct or Supporters' oh, Trust oh, Cup, whatever damn, it was at the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah well. There you oh, go. That's, that's quite good. I, I enjoyed that. That's a game that you can play along with at home as well. I hope you enjoy. That is Nick Zanavev... No, I can't even say it. Nick Zanavri Second Countdowns. <laughs> say that with your pissed. Well, thankfully, Stu, that's not going to happen, is it, for me? So, <laughs> And I, can't even, I couldn't even say it just then. So. <laughs> exactly. Good luck to everyone else out there. Um, right. Final little bits and pieces for the podcast. So just a quick update on the ladies' team then. Successful summer for the England women, who made it all the way to the semi-final, I believe, of the World yeah, Cup. I think they finished they in did third very place. Well. Did we? Did we actually win the third place playoff? No, no we, we didn't. Lost that. We lost that. Never mind. Uh, okay. Just like exactly like the men, we have achieved gender equality. We both got to the semi-finals. We both lost the third, fourth place playoff. So but when you've when you've lost a semi-final, does it really matter? You've, you're beaten, aren't you? Do you know what I mean? But hey, let's be fair, right? What was the what was the ladies what was the ladies World Cup most memorable for? VAR. Yeah. What? A, oh dear. It's women in technology, I tell you. <laughs> oh, we're oh, let's get the complaints. Oh, one. we're going to get complaints again. Oh it's no. The first week. Damn it. <laughs> oh, we can't even cut it out because that'd be boring. No, Joe. You know what? Um, Lucy. Uh, what I would say is, uh, ladies' World Cup was brilliant. Lucy Bronze. What a great right back in terms of. I thought the England team were really good. Really impressed with the Ladies World Cup. Obviously, the difference was in terms of the top end of the game is very good, but there's obviously a massive gap between the bottom end uh, and obviously the Cameroon game was just, oh, just fun to watch. Just fun to watch. VAR. Is that is that coming to a premiership this year? It is. I'm, gonna, oh, I'm saving our VAR nightmare. discussion for next week because oh, oh, I'm going to rant about what it. What a nightmare. What? Absolute and I, bullshit. And I know, <laughs> I know we're going to go on to it, but I did say it's the George, and George basically said, no, you're wrong, Stu. But I did say it's going to get to a stage where people are not going to celebrate goals that much or they're going to be very much thinking, I'm going to... You know, like the old thing where you look round to see if you're offside? Well, now, they're, now, now they're lying, the, the match officials aren't allowed to put their flags up now because basically they're just told to play on until there's a goal scored and then go back and take it off because of VAR. But, oh, it's just a farce. But what I would say to you, it's so fun to watch. If your team's not involved. Yeah, if it's not you that's involved in it. But no. <laughs> it, just, it just creates so many, so many talking points, doesn't it? <laughs> I wish it wouldn't. My talking point would be, get rid of it. But anyway, that's a conversation yeah. for next week. Yes. Ladies, so just a quick update here for you because there's been a bit of recruitment and players departing and what have you. So ladies have signed a few players, signed a couple of midfielders. Steph Mann, Liz O'Callaghan and Helen Ogle will be joining the squad. And then Rosie Russell, Rebecca Sargent, Kelly Hyman, Hannah Billingham, who will be captain next season, and Katie Stanley, who will be vice captain, have all signed to return for next season. But Edie Kelly, you remember goalkeeper who got injured um, playing in Bristol, playing against Bristol City in the Women's FA Cup. She has decided to leave. Not sure where she'll be heading to, but we wish Edie all the best. She was fantastic for the team last season. Season for the ladies starts on the 18th of August, if you want to put that in your diaries, away at Ipswich, which is coincidental because then I think two days later the men are away at Ipswich, so maybe we could sort out some, I don't know, something to alleviate travel costs. I don't know. Um, that is that for the ladies. We will keep you abreast with everything that's going on with the ladies' team as the season continues. This 
remainder of pre-season, Stuart, we're not going to preview them because they're pre-seasons, but we have got Hampton and Richmond away on Saturday and then Crystal Palace at home next Tuesday. So if you are a fan of pre-season, um, might want to take a trip to your doctor, have a discussion about that, maybe seek a counsellor. But if you do enjoy pre-season, those are your last opportunities for this year. And then the real stuff starts next week. Or two weeks, uh, 3rd of August, Rotherham United at home. But of course, we'll be talking more about that next week. That brings to an end the first week of the podcast. We are back for a fifth season. It's ridiculous. I'm not sure we've got any better, but I hope you've enjoyed it. I've got some announcements. Those pre-season friendlies that I've mentioned, updates will be on Twitter at 9 Wild Podcast. You continue to f- continue to follow us there. This podcast is available every week on YouTube, which is now easier than ever to find because our address is youtube.co.uk slash nine yrs podcast nice and simple to remember youtube.co.uk slash nine yrs podcast every single episode of the podcast that we've ever ever done is available on youtube that is the only place you're going to get the full archive of the show we do also upload every week onto our website nine yrs org. so check us out there and as i've already mentioned check out our facebook page facebook.com slash nine yrs podcast comment there on the questions we'll be putting up very regularly throughout the season or email us at any time with your comments if you want us to read out onto the show we will 9yrs at may14.co.uk this sunday the love sport radio show the wimbledon fan show will continue as it has done all summer and we have to say a big thank you to george jones assisted by kevin boras this summer for maintaining that show every sunday at 8 p.m that continues this sunday i haven't asked george yet if he's going to be doing it this sunday i should probably should shouldn't i um, but hopefully george will be on there 8 p.m this sunday evening and that is that Stu, is there anything else you'd like to say should we mention the heat should we mention how warm it is and how you are keeping cool this week uh, ridiculous ridiculous so i've got a fan on actually i haven't got a full blast because you probably won't be able to hear me but yeah i don't really care if people can hear the fan in the background because it is stupid hot isn't it and- awful weather apocalyptic weather the worst weather. Can people stop lying to themselves about the sun? Oh, the sun's out. Isn't it wonderful? No, it's not. It sucks. This is proof of it. Awful. Yeah. It's all right if you've got a, it's all right if you're at a beach or you've got a pool or you're on holiday, but this is rubbish when you're trying to work in it. So, um, yeah. But the only good thing about it is we have a trip to Blackpool for the start of the season. It'll be lovely at Blackpool. Blackpool's lovely in the summer, rubbish in the winter. So, yeah, happy days. Are you driving to, up to the Fleetwood game? I'm not, my wife is. Okay. Um, but you'll so. be in a car on the motorway. Yes. I think we have a podcast feature destined to return, but we shall come back to that in a couple of weeks. <laughs> That's it for now. Thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you very much for downloading us, downloading the show. We will be back next Friday. Do I do the old sign off? It's a new season. I don't know if you want it. Yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's classic, isn't it? Bag first, milk last, Alexa Bliss. Speak to you again next Friday.